I watched 20 classic movies for the first time and I'm gonna review them all, let's go! I think I have to give this film at least an 8 out of 10 just because of how well crafted a movie it is. The film is visually stunning. It's gorgeously colorful and the high contrast between the bright Discovery spacecraft and the pitch blackness of space create the idyllic ambiance for this type of film. I appreciated the primary use of orchestral music in the first half of the film. Hey! I appreciated the use of orchestral music in the first half of the film as it created this iconic emotional tone but also kept the pace going. Whereas it probably would have just been white noise for an hour. And while it was a bummer that the most iconic part of the movie, HAL 9000, wasn't in it for very long, I very much enjoyed that section and I felt that it added to the already captivating experience the film was. And for being done in 1968 further warrants my praise for how the practical effects still hold up today and maintain the reputable presentation the film has. It's the quintessential space movie, I wish I could talk more about it. Don't. Oh. Yo, this crop effect sucks. Absolute carnage. There's apparently a documentary about the making of this film and all of the troubles that underwent its production, and it's easy to see why. These sets are gigantic and meticulous, and the sounds of the explosions create this intense warfare experience that completely took me by surprise. Just the sheer scale of this film is enough to be praised on its own and would definitely reward me if I ever went back to rewatch it. Uh, that being said, some of the character deaths didn't hit me as hard as perhaps they were meant to, but regardless, I was completely glued to my screen as everything was going down. Uh, for those wondering, I watched the theatrical version of the film. I know that there are other cuts out there that are longer in length, but uh, this one felt quite nice. The pacing was great, didn't leave me bored or tired. Um, the loud, bombastic, and violent moments of this film uh, always uh, juxtapose the quieter moments of the film, where little is spoken or heard, and uh, it carries so effectively throughout the entire film. Uh, it was a horrifying joy to watch this movie, and I can definitely see why it's held in such high regard. I would definitely recommend it. Citizen Kane, the world's first movie. Uh, but in all seriousness, I really enjoyed this a lot more than I was anticipating. The life of Charles Foster Kane was quite a heartfelt one, while also being quite tragic once you got to the end of the film. Uh, I assume that Orson Welles co-writing, producing, directing, and starring in the film might have skewed how the main character was written, but uh, no, he played it remarkably well, both as the young, cocky Kane and his older, crooked counterpart. And I also like the bitter ending of the film as well, because it added a lot more depth to the uh, life of Kane with that newfound context. Uh, and I also think it was the first time that I actually understood what the film was going for, when in most cases, I don't really get symbolism or metaphors in movies. And also that screaming cockatoo. It just, like, t I thought it was my copy, but ten minutes before the end of the film, a cockatoo just shows up and scares the living daylights out of its audience. And uh, I, I got me, but it was pretty good for a chuckle. Uh, but overall, I really enjoyed this film. I didn't adore it to the degree where its place in pop culture might have suggested, but uh, still a pretty good film regardless. You have one unheard message. To check unheard messages, press... First unheard message. Hey Jackson, it's me, uh, Jackson. Listen, sorry I couldn't be there to film, but to be honest, there's not much to say about First Blood. It's a fun action movie to kill 90 minutes. The uh, forest is landscaped, the film takes place in are beautiful, as you would expect. Uh, Stallone's terse and stoic performance as he preys on his foes is quite uh, entertaining for the most part. His speech at the end tied a neat little bow onto everything, even if the ending was sort of abrupt. The side characters were serviceable, not much to say about them. Uh, it was just sort of fine. It had a good story, but nothing really grabbed me all that much. Uh, there's uh, nothing very tangible to carry with me after seeing the movie. It works for what it is, though. I'd give it like a 6 out of 10. Uh, but yeah, sorry to, uh, sorry to be there to film. I'll probably be back next week uh, if I can get myself out of hot water with the Russian mafia. Pro tip, they do not like it when you make fun of their silly little accent. <laughs> they throw a hissy for those like, I will break your neck and neck and neck. Amateurs? Oh, hey. Very interesting film Fight Club was. Edward Norton's performance, I feel, aged like a fine wine throughout the film that blossomed into an exciting climax in the final half hour. Brad Pitt likewise held together the movie with its just stunning abs and perfect casual cadence. Having not read the film, I'm unsure how much of its dialogue was ripped straight from the source, but regardless, the film's writing was incredibly sharp and concise and helped grow the identity of the main characters. The sound design was also pretty cool. The plane crashes and the brutal meaty slaps of flesh hitting flesh and body slamming against the floor helped keep the intense chaotic feeling going throughout. It's quite a stylistic film too, aside from the cheesy flash cuts and outdated edits. I feel that the film's murky color palette actually helped immerse me into the film further. I also enjoyed the set design, mainly of the main house, because it's probably David Fincher's uh, style that helped cement the gross and dingy atmosphere of this derelict spot. It was horrifyingly vivid, but it was also a really good watch. 
And also, Brad Pitt's just so jacked. Terminator was an all right movie. I didn't necessarily love it, but it was all oh, right. Oh yes, this was the scene where I talked about Terminator. As you can see, our budget was uh, horribly cut for this section. I do recall recording this and mocking the special effects. You know, for the time they might have been serviceable, but when we first see Arnold's robotic eye, it was, it was just laughably bad. But the movie overall was, was cheesy and enjoyable, you know, a good popcorn movie complete with a, uh, a blink and you'll miss it sex scene that I, uh, I did watch again. Uh, I really enjoyed the first half of this film too because uh, while it did have its action-packed moments, it was the pacing that uh, kept me engaged with the stoic character of the Terminator doing his terminating things and mixed with Sarah's realization of what's going on. It was a simple little murder mystery type thing, you know, that helped move the plot along. I did enjoy Arnold's performance, though. I was not expecting him to be as silent and deadly as he turned out to be, but it helped uh, the momentum in the more intense moments. Uh, but yeah, like I said, it was a fun watch and it was a good, uh, good film. Good fellas was good, fellas. Uh, in my opinion, truly a seminal film by Scorsese, especially when you consider the productions he'd go on to make, like uh, uh, Wolf of Wall Street and The Irishman. The latter of which actually is a bit redundant. Now that I, uh, you know, after seeing this one. I don't watch many gangster movies, but it's easy to see how Goodfellas could easily, you know, have helped perfect the art of uh, the uh, story, the characters, and the evolution of these types of films. The main cast was also superb. I specifically enjoyed Lorraine Bracco's performance as Karen Hill. Uh, I thought that she, her character blew me away and uh, was one of my favorites of the film. Uh, the air appropriate music was great. Uh, the script was well written and it was just general, a very good Scorsese film. Would recommend. I think a lot of the magic of Shawshank being such an enjoyable movie probably comes down to uh, the simplicity and its characters. Uh, from moment one, I was sold by Red's personality, uh, probably helped with his narration, and so the evolving story of Andy Dufresne, <laughs> this is a bad idea, and so the evolving story of Andy Dufresne, with every step it took, hooked me in and kept the pace, feeling engaged and yet patient. And with every time we saw Andy make a success with one of his adventures, it was gratifying, and with every loss, it felt profoundly melancholic, yet understandable. <laughs> Frank Darabont did a wonderful job with the screenplay, and through his directing, Shawshank came to life, uh, perhaps not as much of a grim version of prison compared to what we see today, but still provided a picturesque environment for any viewer to get engaged with the life all the characters lead. Uh, I'd give it an 8 out of 10, probably pretty, pretty good classic. This I would give a 0 out of 10, this is a terrible idea, and I'm never doing this again. <laughs> all the blood, oh, it's rushing to my head. I do wish more films catered to this type of terror. Is int the intimidating and sinister glare. I do wish more films catered to this type of terror. The intimidating and sinister glare of Anthony Hopkins alone is enough to make this film especially unsettling. Though he is not in it for long, his time on screen is incredibly captivating and effectively uneasy. Jodie Foster also had a wonderful performance, but I do wish that we had more of her backstory than what we got in the film. But what we have is enough for the idea that the title imposes. The finale was also exciting and nail-biting. Ted Levine as Buffalo Bill was just incredibly unsettling. Any scenes with these actors is enough to terrify me to my core. A good film? I blinked. Fuck. I think this might be my most contentious review out of the bunch, and you're probably not going to like what I have to say. Uh, I really did not care much for The Godfather. <laughs> There's a part of me that thinks that I can appreciate a slow burn movie, even if the movie in question doesn't tickle my fancy as much as others. But this one was so boring. The 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 acting was fine. I thought you know Marlon Brando iconically portrayed Vito Corleone, the Don, and Al Pacino was fine as well. Uh, but there were certain issues with the editing that I felt were detrimental to certain scenes, like character deaths, uh, where the scenes would be cut too short, or the audio would be choppy, or noticeably ADR'd. I mean, the movie was made competently, but the issue I feel is that I didn't have much of a connection with the film. And even though there were some pretty good scenes, I just didn't feel like the movie was impactful in the kind of story that it was trying to tell. And I also wish that Al Pacino's character arc was a bit more focused in the film. I felt like his character transition was a lot more snappy, and not as gradually explored as I would have liked, so that uh, that didn't necessarily help my enjoyment of the film. Um, but a lot of people say that the second movie is a lot better than the first, you know? That's kind of the hot debate right now. So when I was making this list, I thought, okay, I'll go and watch the second movie, and who knows, maybe I'll like it better.
It was better. I think what makes me like this movie a lot more would probably be its set design and uh, its cinematography, especially with all of the extras that are crowded into one scene. More shots this time around stood out to me as being, you know, really beautiful, and especially the New York City scenes. They felt so rich and authentic with so many extras populating the scene that it, it just felt more visually engaging. And it's definitely something that you see Francis Ford Coppola go on to do in movies like Apocalypse Now. And even though I really liked Robert De Niro's uh, subplot in the film, it falls short of the same issues that Al Pacino's character arc did in the first movie. I feel like if there was established tension, then these kind of more boring scenes where it's mostly just talking would be more impactful, but there wasn't any tension, and so I didn't care, and it was very boring. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just don't think I enjoyed these movies because there just didn't seem to be much of a pulse. It felt like a lot of this film was just sort of dull conversations and they weren't enough to carry me through them. I and even though there were some pretty good scenes in this one as well, they essentially salt what I think is a pretty uninteresting movie. I mean, these movies just kind of feel like I'm sitting in on a lot of boring business deals. A combined six hours of boring business deals. Um, so get your pitchforks ready. I'll be sitting here waiting for you. That's my review. <laughs> I think the biggest problem I had with Rocky is probably the audio mixing of the dialogue. I don't know if it was just maybe partly because of Stallone's thick accent, but everyone was so difficult to hear in the movie I had to end up using subtitles. And also the ending fight felt a bit anticlimactic, but I mean aside from that, I mean the thick theme was sick. And also Butkus, Butkus the dog, cool Butkus. I really enjoyed Stallone as Rocky, he felt like a very endearing character thanks to his quick wit and goofiness. Uh, I also enjoyed his rapport with Adrian, even though it was that one time where he kind of forced her into his apartment. It's a bit uncomfortable to today's standards, but still pretty good. And I mean, the film was very nice. He felt like a good part of the neighborhood that he was in. You know, it made the whole tone of the film feel a lot more lively, like we were experiencing a part of his neighborhood. Stupid planes. But it was a good movie. It didn't grab me as much as I hoped it would, but I mean, for a Rocky movie, it's, it's of quality, I guess. With every film I see starring Robert De Niro, the more I come to the realization that he is a fantastic actor. It's definitely the awkward underdog roles that he plays that I'm more captivated by than his uh, intimidating gangster shooty man. The film's score is beautiful, especially with that sexy sax riff that plays throughout. It can be a bit intrusive, especially since it plays like 10 times throughout the film, but the theme is so good that I rarely get bored by it. The dialogue can be hilarious sometimes and enthralling at other times. Uh, I also love all the minor details that blend with the film well, like the gum under Travis's shoe, and also his inner monologue slowing down as he's writing his thoughts down in the journal. The cinematography is also fantastic, uh, especially during the nighttime segments. The film has a very romantic view of New York City, uh, especially with all of its vibrant colors and exciting nightlife. And I also love the violence in the film. I love it when these older films, especially Scorsese's films, uh, play no music during these moments. It makes everything feel raw and stand out more than if, uh, especially if the film's previous tone was a bit more subdued. Hello, it's me. Uh, it's 3 a.m. right now. I'm very tired, but I thought I would talk to you about one of the movies, uh, A Clockwork Orange. Uh, it was very strange. It was very unsettling, uh, creepy, uncomfortable, but very well made, because it's, it's a Stanley Kubrick joint. It's very well done. Malcolm McDowell uh, had a wonderful performance. I thought he was fantastic in the role. I was thinking, you know, because uh, the character of Alex, I think that's his name, uh, throughout pop culture is so widely referenced that when I was watching it, I couldn't see anyone else in that role besides Malcolm McDowell. Um, so he did a great job in that regard. And I mean, it stood the test of time. It's a wonderful performance. Uh, there were a lot of shots that were, you know, uncomfortable. Um, also very beautiful because he uses his, his wide angle lens. It's a very, very pretty movie. Um, but I feel like it didn't stick with me very much. You know, uh, I think that the morals and the messages and the theming of it all really uh, are concrete and stayed within the realm of the film. I wasn't really thinking about anything uh, beyond after watching it, uh, but it was still pretty good. I would I would recommend it. It's not, not a fun watch, but uh, it's pretty interesting. <laughs> Gosh, this movie is so forking funny. Half attributed to the great writing by Joel and Ethan Cohen, who brought together this hilariously engrossing investigational type story, and the other half being the fabulous actors who portrayed their characters remarkably well. Uh, the rapport between the dude, uh, Walter and Donnie, had me laughing the loudest I'd had in a movie in a long time. This is funnier than most dedicated comedy movies you see today, and with it is a fun story that the film fully leans into the absurdity of. The writing and acting definitely holds the movie together, and there are also certain moments, specifically 
specifically during the dude's uh, trips uh, that executed fantastic cinematography and set design. Uh, the film, uh, time blew away while I was watching this film. Uh, the pacing is fantastic, rarely losing me or straying away, and it helped keep the film's momentum that it had from the very first moments that we met Lebowski. Overall, good film, great film, 8 out of 10. Thank you very much. Well, would you look at that? I said I was never going to film in the car again. And uh, here I am. But let's talk about Reservoir Dogs. Uh, no matter which film you're talking about in his career, you're always going to get a very talkative screenplay uh, from Quentin Tarantino. Whether this is because uh, the words sound good out of the characters' mouths or because it's to grow bondage of the characters, uh, I don't know. But regardless, in this film, I felt like the dialogue didn't uh, attract me as well as it would go on to in future films as Quentin Tarantino would fine-tune his dialogue. Uh, but still, I thought it was a pretty fun 90 minutes that just oozed this stage play uh, feeling. So it's no surprise that it was actually thought to be one at one point when they were making it, but uh, you know, it was a movie instead. Uh, the characters were very fun to watch as their panic was equally heightened and tempered within their group. Uh, but it was pretty good. I don't think it holds up terribly much, especially when you consider how well he would fine-tune his films as uh, he went on. But still, it was an interesting watch, perhaps a perhaps a seminal watch, if we're going to use uh, big fancy words that I don't know the meaning to. Uh, but yeah, uh, I thought it was all right all around. So in Eraserhead, there's this dude named Henry Spencer, and he spat some sperm out of his mouth to make a baby with this woman. But the baby's kind of a freaky little sucker. Here's, here's, here's a picture. Uh, and the wife is just not having it with the baby crying all night, so she leaves him indefinitely. And then Henry sees a woman in his radiator that sings about how in heaven everything is fine and also stomps on a bunch of enlarged sperms. And then uh, Henry uh, you know, also has sex with the neighbor next door, and they fall into a milk puddle that's in the middle of his bed. Then he meets the lady in the radiator on a stage where his head falls off to reveal a baby sprouting out of his head. There's, there's a picture of that as well. Uh, and then his head falls onto Earth, where a guy drills into it to make the eraser heads for pencils. Get it? I guess it's the name of the movie. But in the last act, Henry cuts open his baby and stabs it, and then its neck elongates, and then its head expands, launching straight towards him, where he ends up in heaven. And also there's a dude who's a man on the planet who controls everything. If you dig into it, it's kind of like an expression on fears of parenthood that's veiled beneath the body horror show. But I don't know. What do you think? Hmm. Why did it take three days for Jesus to respawn? <laughs> <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for listening to my eraser head story. Yeah, much love. All right, have a good one, man. Bye-bye. I was initially very excited to watch this film on the basis of it being a bank heist gone wrong type of movie, and while the comedy roped me in at the beginning, I didn't expect it to be such an emotional story. Uh, the pacing did falter a bit for me in the latter half of the film with uh, a lot of the slower phone calls going back and forth, but in retrospect, I do see that as benefiting the emotionally intense aspects that I liked about the film overall. Uh, the ending, too, without giving too much away, uh, just uh, I feel like a lot of the themes carry through to times that we're in today, and so it was fun to just sort of sit and think about it after the credits started rolling. And also, most importantly, Al Pacino did a wonderful job in his role, and it was just incredibly fun to watch. Not to forget his uh, sidekick, uh, played by John Cazal, who had a wonderful comedic subtlety to his performance as well. Uh, but yeah, I was surprised by how much I enjoyed this film, and uh, definitely would recommend it. Oh, you, you, you keep sneaking into my house, don't you? Uh, I guess you want to know about No Country for Old Men. Uh, it was pretty good. It's an out of ten. <laughs> Uh, the wit uh, writing was pretty sharp and witty, uh, although with their sort of country accents, it was a bit difficult to understand what they were saying. So I had to kind of had to put on subtitles, but that's nothing new at this point. Um, pretty interesting. I love how the Coen brothers can implement like comedy and, and drama and philosophical ideas all into one movie. And it works for them quite a lot of the time. And this movie is no exception. Um, it was pretty uh, fun. That scene in the uh, apartment was, was the coolest out of the film. It, Nailed tension, it was fantastic. The, the film is beautiful, cinematography by Roger Deakins. Gotta love some Deakins cinematography. Uh, but yeah, it was pretty good. Uh, obviously, Spotlight goes on to uh, Javier Bardem as Anton Chigurh, who uh, was pretty creepy uh, and did his role well. And uh, overall, I think, you know, it, it was a good film to think about, but didn't stick with me terribly much. Uh, but yeah, get the heck out of my house. I'm finished!
Get it? Get it? Like, like, like from the movie? Anyway, uh, I really like this film. I feel like I'll, I'll give it a rating higher than perhaps maybe I personally enjoyed it because uh, uh, I, I, I felt like it was a seven out of ten. But like, there were so many great aspects that I feel like heightened the 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 experience of the film. Like the score by Johnny Greenwood was was just incredible. It was refreshing to hear a score of that caliber, and it complemented the film very well, but also added its own unique layer and unique like character to the film. Uh, the directing by Paul Thomas Anderson was really good. A lot of nice sweeping shots, slow zooms. It was it was a very pleasing movie to watch. But my God, Daniel Day Lewis killed it in this movie. He was fantastic. He he completely transformed. You see a you see a photo of him like when he's not on set when he's just him and you're like that's a completely different person. He he killed in this movie. He was he was a fantastic presence. It was so great to just watch him be this very greedy evil man. Uh, it, it was it was just it was an utter joy to watch him and 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 throughout the whole film i think he just he completely dominated this movie um but yeah i mean i thought it was a pretty good film to end on and then this uh this list of 20 movies on uh it would recommend uh it was it was really good would you believe it well that was something <laughs> Thank you so much for watching this uh, idea that I had. I'd like to do it again sometime, but I feel like if I do it again, I probably should do it more in a video diary type thing, because this was quite an ambitious idea uh, that I couldn't get out of my head. So I had to just, just crunch it out and get it done. If you watch to the end, uh, thank you. You have done your Good Samaritan deed for the day. Uh, you can do whatever you want now. Rob a bank, I really don't care. Thank you very much again for watching this. Uh, that's the video. Mm -hmm.